you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you most of all for having the opportunity to speak to you here. It's a great privilege for me. Uh, it's certainly, as you said, a difficult topic I'm going to speak about because of here emotions are always involved. I, I hope that I have found a proper language to deal with this so that we indeed will have the discussion in the aftermath. Two weeks ago, on November 14th, a monument was inaugurated for the more than 100 soldiers who had died in Germany's international military missions since 1992. 37 of them who had been killed in combat or during terrorist attacks, 67 who had lost their lives in accidents. Against the initial idea to place this monument in the very center of Berlin, close to the German parliament, the so-called Forest of Remembrance, consisting of seven wooden crosses and trees with the inscription of names of the fallen soldiers, against the initial idea to place this monument close to the parliament in the center of Berlin, the monument in the end was opened in a very remote village outside of Berlin and inside a military barrack with no easy access for the broader public. In a society like the German one, in which any international military engagement still is highly controversial and which after four, 15 years of peace suddenly is confronted with the necessity to integrate the remembrance of fallen soldiers into our collective memory. In such a society, the monument immediately caused a public debate. While those who in principle are against any German military engagement abroad rejected any idea of such a war monument as politically inappropriate, others criticized its remote place as and I quote a politician, a shameful attempt to hide the remembrance of the dead soldiers from the public instead of granting them a dignified public space. It had, however, been the families of the fallen soldier who advocated the monument's modest and discreet place and outlook, wishing not to create a space for ritualized commemorations and political celebrations, and it were the families who explicitly had asked to refrain from any heroic image. What they sought was not a site of official memory, but an opportunity to cope with their grief over their fallen sons, daughters, and husbands. The example of this monument and the controversial debate around it I think indicate at least two very important aspects which are also crucial and relevant for our topic today. First of all, they illustrate the fundamental difficulties to come to the terms with the legacy of war in a reasonable way. Any society which has gone through the experience of violence is confronted with. Wars in general are such a dramatic break of experiences and continuity that both the individual and the society as a whole find it hard to integrate this experience into the memory. Wars, therefore, almost and everywhere are producing a crisis of memory. The society and the individual historical orientation has to be readjusted to the experience of a violent past. <coughs> Secondly, the given example of the German monument illustrates that the memory of war always is caught between two different and sometimes competing dimensions. On the one, representing the war in the public memory usually is seen as part of the state's identity politics, trying to make use of memory for, to legitimate the political order and the nation. On the other hand, however, the memory of war, in particular from the perspective of the relatives, the families and the friends of the dead, on the other hand, the memory of war primarily is seen as a way to cope 
with the experience of loss. Remembering the war for them is less an expression of any official narrative of the past or part of the nation's identity, but as the American historian Jay Winter has called it, and I quote him, is in a collective expression in stone and in ceremony to help the individual to accept the brutal fact of death, unquote. And sometimes, as we can see from this German example, both dimension of war memory, the official one and the private one, can be in attention and have to be negotiated. It is just because of this dramatic character of experiences of war that wars at any period of time and in any culture always have been very present in the collective memory of societies. Even in long periods of time, of peace, they continued to be inscribed in our remembrance through monuments and museums, through celebrations and cemeteries, in public discourses, and in the families. The way how we have commemorated wars during the last two centuries, however, has changed as much as the character of war has changed. During the 19th century, the memory of wars all over Europe had been closely linked to the idea of the nation. Remembering the war in public, first of all intended to claim the citizen's duty to sacrifice himself for the sake of the nation. Even the World War I, whose centennial we have celebrated so intensively this year, and which had confronted the European societies with an unprecedented dimension of killing and dying, even the World War I did not really erode this nationalist function of war memories. It was only the Second World War, the experience of the Holocaust and the mass killings, not only at the front lines, but also in the cities, among soldiers and civilians, it was only the experience of the Second World War which changed our attitude towards the memory of war. After Hiroshima and Auschwitz, to quote Jay Winter again, former ways of remembrance simply could not be repeated anymore. This was not only the case in Germany, where the society due to Germany's role during the Second World War and its responsibility for war crimes had to rebuild its identity by radically and critically confronting itself with the past. But also those countries who, like France or Great Britain, had fought in a just war against Nazi Germany and who had won the war, even those countries did not return to the former ways of an heroic commemoration of the war which they still had practiced after the First World War. And even the United States, which after the Second World War in the beginning continued its kind of triumphant traditions of commemorating wars, since the war in Vietnam had to look for a new and a different language of war memory, which found its first expression in the famous, however also very disputed, Vietnam Memorial in Washington. And I would like to show you this change of language in the monuments which appeared in the United States. The first one, I don't know, can you see it? Is it? Is it? Yeah. The first one from 1954 is still designed in a somewhat triumphant way. The soldiers were placing the American flag on Japanese soil, while the Vietnam Memorial is refraining from any kind of this heroic image, just writing down the, num the name of the dead soldiers. But as I said, it was disputed, and in particular, veterans from the war demanded a different kind of uh, monument, which was erected two years later uh, in a much more, in a, in a more traditional way of expressing it. There was only very few countries, and in particular the Soviet Union, which after the Bolshevik Revolution had refrained from any official memory of the First Ball, which now, after 1945, commemorated its role in the Second World War still in a heroic and glorifying manner as the Great Patriotic War. No less, for the socialist Yugoslavia, the partisan war became the main source of legitimacy, both for the Yugoslav state and its socialist system, being cultivated for almost 40 years in narratives, 
hundreds of parties and monuments, and annual celebrations. Here again, the war memory served more the state's interest to legitimate its order than to offer the people a real place for coming to terms with its experiences. While school textbooks, movies, and the official narratives during the social, socialist Yugoslavia were glorifying the partisans and also their violence, often in a very belligerent language, at least the war monuments in Yugoslavia since the 1970s also refrained from such a language, shifting more to an abstract way of expressions. Again, I have some examples. Some of you might, be, might remember these monuments uh, from the socialist period from the 1970s on, and you see that they are not showing these heroic partisans anymore, but they were all expressed in a very abstract uh, language. Uh, here, uh, it uh, took up a kind of style which was present all over Europe at that time. In most European countries, therefore, after the experiences of World War II and differing from former centuries, the war, as the late German historian Reinhard Koselleck once has posted, the war could only be remembered as a question, not as an answer anymore. Any sense of war had become questionable, and representing the war in public had to avoid easy and simple political or ideological messages. War memory primarily had to be a site of mourning, not a site of memory any longer. Since then, and particular since the violent conflicts have increased in number after the end of the Cold World War, of the Cold War, we have developed a wide range of interim instruments how to deal with the legacy of wars and violences. In particular, legal and semi-legal instruments have been established to call to account those who have been responsible for war crimes. Transitional justice has become a major tool for dealing with wars and violence, both on an international and national level. International war crime tribunals had already been tested without any great success after World War I. They were applied as an extraordinary instrument after World War II with regard to Germany and Japan, and since the Yugoslav wars and the genocide in Rwanda, they have turned into an institutionalized international way of dealing with violence on a legal basis. But no less, national courts, also in the Yugoslav case, increasingly have been obliged and pressured to deal with war crimes. Besides those legal procedures which have gained an increasing importance, also other more semi-legal instruments have been introduced. And the most famous one certainly is the idea of truce and reconciliation commissions, which have been applied in particular in the South African case, but also in Latin America, and which, however, was not a big success, have been debated also in the Yugoslav case. Educational instruments have been given a particular intention in order to overcome the legacy of hostility, hostilities and to foster the process of peace building once the war had ended. Again, the case of the former Yugoslavia, I think, is a good example where tremendous international activities and resources have been invested since the end of the wars in order to turn education into a successful tool not only for creating a short-term peace, but for overcoming the mental reasons behind the many conflicts. Public discourses and debates, of course, are an important field through which a society is negotiating on how to deal with the past. But no less literature, film, and other artistic ways of expression have played a particular role in finding a common language within a society to speak about the past. Symbolic means gain a certain importance in this process as well. Monuments, celebrations and commemoration, symbolic gestures can contribute to reconciliation, but they also can obstruct or even prevent it. While civilians being increasingly affected by the violence of wars, 
psychotherapeutic instruments also have apply have been applied in an increasing number also again in particular uh, as far as the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s are concerned as a way as an instrument to cope with the legacy of wars finally also the idea of silencing the past has been seriously discussed far from being meant simply as a suppression of memory the consensus of silence, as the Spanish writer Jorge Semprún has once called it for his country, the idea of silencing the past has been suggested as an attempt to appease a society which is still heavily divided by conflict and to offer the people an opportunity to recover from the past. Some authors in this sense have called for, I quote, the civilizing power of forgetting instead of burdening the society with emotional and often destabilizing debates on the past. The wars on the former Yugoslavia have, has, have brought up the question how to remember the past and how to make use of these instruments up on the table again. And to summarize the results of my paper, I think that none of the societies which came out of Yugoslavia's dissolution up until now has found an appropriated way to deal with the past. Nor have any of these instruments in the Yugoslav case really produced a convincing result. It certainly would be too short-sighted to condemn the post-Yugoslav societies in general for ignoring the past or escaping from any self-critical reflection over what has happened. I indeed see a lot of examples and initiatives to come to terms with the past and some of them will be mentioned later on. The overall picture, however, in my view, at best can be called ambivalent. And without slipping into a know-all manner, I hard, hard, a critical remarks, I think, hardly cannot be and should not be avoided. I don't have the time here to speak about all these instruments and I don't also don't have the time to speak about all the post Yugoslav uh, countries, uh, but some examples and illustration must be sufficient to indicate where I see the results, the outcomes, but also the shortcomings of this uh, process. Let us look at some of these instruments. Uh, legal instruments, for example, in which a lot of hope and expectation have been invested in order to overcome the legacy of wars. Legal instruments, in my view, have produced a mixed, but certainly not entirely negative results. I'm a historian, not a legal expert, but I think that in particular the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, often being criticized for being slow, selective, inefficient and incoherent in its sentences, I think that the ICTY has done a much better job than many of the critics, both inside and outside the region, claim. At least as far as its strictly legal work is concerned. It certainly, however, has not fulfilled, in my view, the many ambitions, and I would say the over-ambitions, which had expected the ICTY to become an instrument for reconciliation and peace-building within the societies themselves. In fact, I think the impact of its work on the societies, their mentalities and their interpretation of the past was more than limited. In all post-Yugoslav countries, and I would include Kosovo here as well, in all, all post-Yugoslav countries, the ICTY's work was just exploited in favor of the prevailing narrative of the war, but hardly was challenging it. That means, as long as the other was put on trial, this was seen as a confirmation of one's own perception of the war. When people from one's own community were put on trial, however, the court was rejected as being biased. Thus, disappointment about unfulfilled expectations and an increasing lack of interest in its work was the best the court could reach. More often, however, the ICTY openly was and still is rejected and questioned in many segments of the society. Some have argued that the court's activity might have been even been counterproductive at least as far as the chances for democratization are concerned, because it had strengthened those nationalist forces 
who were not interested in any critical perception of the past anyway. I wouldn't personally, I would personally wouldn't go so far, but I think indeed that the ICTY's opportunities and resources to affect the individual societies were in a favorable, that means in a more reconciling way, that these resources indeed were very limited. Local courts also, in my view, have developed in a rather positive way as far as their strict legal work is concerned, at least in countries like Croatia, but also in Bosnia and even in Serbia. Substantial legal capacities to deal with war crimes have been built up here over the last decade, and the work of the local courts, also by foreign experts, usually have been evaluated as being increasingly professional and unbiased. And while the critique certainly is not unfounded that the big fishes from upper political and military strata hardly have been put on trial by those local courts, some, in fact, remarkable sentences on the mid-level have been pronounced during the last years. Kosovo and dealing with the war on Kosovo, as far as I can see it, seem to be lacking behind this process, mostly due, of course, to still unresolved questions between Serbia and Kosovo and the many unsolved conflicts between the two sides, which, of course, makes any legal cooperation in this field more than difficult for the moment. But again, I think that also the work of the local courts have had only a limited effect on the society's perceptions of the wars. Local trials in Serbia as well as in Croatia and Bosnia have attracted public interest only at the beginning, but soon disappeared from the public debate. The, little, the generally little trust in the legal system in those countries obviously has contributed to the fact that local courts are not seen as a reliable institution to deal with the wartime past. There is little to say about the idea of a Truce and Reconciliation Commission, which also in the case of Yugoslavia had been brought up very early, but which up until now failed to develop into a real instrument for coming to terms with the past. First initiatives in that direction already were brought up during the wars in Bosnia in the 1990s, but they did not materialize at all. A later idea of such a commission in Serbia under the government of President Kostunica in the early 2000s was more meant as an instrument to reaffirm the Serbian narrative of war than to come to a reconciliation and disappeared from the scene even before it had started its work. More recent initiatives like the so-called Regional Commission on Truth-Telling, RECOM, at least has gained a broader political backing and I think it had started substantial initiatives to record testimonies of war crimes during all of the Yugoslav wars. After having been established in 2006, it gained official support from the Croatian and the Serbian government, and it was also encouraged in its work by the, at that time, Kosovo Prime Minister Thaci in 2011. While there obviously was a certain support of the idea of RECOM also among the Kosovo public, Relations between RECOM and some Kosovo NGOs <coughs> being included in the work, as far as I can see it, were not free of tensions, leading to the withdrawal of some of them. For the moment, to me, it seems an open question if RECOM's work, being useful and courageous and beneficial in general, if RECOM's work really will be able and will have the power to trigger down into the society. In general, therefore, it seems to me that the overall political framework in the former Yugoslavia and the character of the conflict in that area probably were not a very favorable, were not very favorable for a truce and reconciliation commission, and maybe that this particular instrument might not be a promising one for this type of conflict. While legal instruments thus have played an ambivalent role in overcoming the legacy of wars, I think educational instruments hardly can be seen as having been more successful. Substantial resources have been invested in this field, both by international institutions and NGOs, following the idea that it is basically education which is a crucial instrument to overcome hostilities. The German-French or the German-Polish, as well as the Northern Irish experiences, 
where reconciliation had been brought up also through educational means, the German French, the German Polish, or the Northern Irish uh, experience often are taken as a kind of role model also for the Southeast European countries, ignoring, however, that they all took place under totally different and, in general, much more favorable conditions. Looking at the current situation in the post Yugoslav space, some progress in this field indeed cannot be denied. Major steps have been undertaken to improve the quality of textbooks, curricula, and teachers' qualification in all post Yugoslav republics, mainly by support of European institutions and NGOs, like, for example, the European Association of History Teachers, to which Kosovo also has become a regular member recently. Textbooks, for example, in particular in Croatia, even when dealing with the wars in the 1990s, have become much more multi-perspective than they were still during the 1990s and early 2000s. On the opposite, this has been much, much less the case in Serbia, where in particular over the last years I cannot see any real process as far as, for example, the history textbooks are concerned. Progress has been somewhat disappointing also in the Bosnian case. Certainly the textbooks have been cleaned from hate speech and open prejudices. The pedagogical quality of the books on all sides have improved, as well as the teacher's competences. Some elements of multi-perspectivity have been introduced in the textbooks, as far, at least as far as some ma minor historical topics are concerned. And at least in the... Now I lost one page. That is really a mess. Where has this gone? Page 14 is missing. I'm sorry, I have to summarize that, hoping that I'm still remembering. Um, yes, uh, textbooks have, have incre uh, improved in uh, all of these countries, and also in Bosnia, hate speech has been eliminated, uh, and in some parts, as in the Federation, the Croat uh, Muslim Federation, uh, teachers even have access to uh, a choice between uh, different uh, textbooks. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the ethnocentric presentation of history in those textbooks here have not been uh, overcome. It's three different and in cup not uh, three very different and antagonistic pictures of the past which are presented in those textbooks. And in particular, which is a point of critique, is that the wars of the 1990s, still in most of the textbooks of Bosnia, are not presented in class. They do not speak about the war. Only few do, and if they do, uh, then they do it in a very unbalanced uh, way. That means that today, one and a half generation of young Bosnians have been brought up without being confronted with the war in school teaching which of course is a problem. That does not mean that it is not talked about the war in class, but not on the basis of a proper textbook material. And it seems that even the teachers still do not feel very comfortable to teach about that topic. Um, I would like to show you a sh the results of a short survey we have made a couple of years ago. Um, and you see that only 52% of the teachers said, yes, the war should be dealt with in class. Now we can debate if the glass is half full or half empty. On the one, 50% want to, more than 50% want to talk about the war in class, but on the other hand, it's still half of the teachers who do not feel comfortable to do so. Um, that indicates how difficult um, the problem is in the educational field. By the way, this is not just a Bosnian or a Yugoslav phenomenon. We have similar results also from interviews with teachers, for example, in Northern Ireland, where the teachers have wonderful, fantastic teaching material, but still there, many teachers say, I feel uncomfortable to talk about the Northern Irish conflict in class. So it's a very a structural problem. 
Due to my non-existing language in Albanian, I'm hesitating to offer any solid opinion on the state of affairs in Kosovo here in this respect. Um, but from a very superficial perception of the history textbook in Kosovo, I still will, would be more cautious, suspect, suspecting that uh, even this history textbook here in this country mainly are still following a very narrow concept of ethnic identity, which in my view is not totally in accordance with the self-understanding of the Republic of Kosovo and the constitutional principles as a civic and multi-ethnic uh, state. The narrative of wars, and here let me come to another instrument, is created basically through public discourses and debates. And while certainly in all post-Yugoslav republics we can find different competing narratives of the war, in all of them a single official narrative can be identified dominating the public opinion. These state and elite-sponsored hegemonic narratives of the war, in my view, offer very little what really can contribute to a process of reconciliation. All of these narratives, and this has been criticized time and again, are heavily monoperspective, seeing one's own ethnic group just as the only or at least at the major victim of the war and presenting the other <coughs> exclusively as the aggressor. This kind of victimization narrative leaves little space for the experiences of others and it opens up even less opportunities for a critical reflection upon, about one's own behavior during the war. Human rights violation of one's own ethnic group in these narratives are at best not denied, but usually they are rationalized as self-defense. Only very few attempts have been made by politicians to break up this autistic view of the wars. The former Croatian president, Stipe Mesic, for example, was the first one who opened up the question of Croatian human rights violations during the war in the 1990s and thus eroding the self-perception of a clean and honorable Croatian homeland war which for long had been undisputed within the Croat public. His revisionism, however, met with substantial reservation in the public and with resistance from powerful memory entrepreneurs like the war veterans. And it is an open question how much this change uh, in his, uh, or his political statements in this uh, question, how much they really uh, infiltrated the broader society and changed the general perception of the wars. In any case, there hardly was anybody else in the other post yugoslav republics to follow this example of going beyond the established assumptions of the official war narratives. Only actors outside politics have tried to counterbalance these mainstream narratives, these political narratives. In particular, writers from all post-Yugoslav areas, but also movies or other artists, in my view, have contributed to offer a memory which is not following the ethnocentric master narrative, but which are trying to approach the always tragic dimension any war is characterized by, characterized by for the individual. Some of these artists in this field even have tried to break up the traditional perspective of the war by making use of irony. Bosnian artists, for example, a couple of years ago, as a kind of counter-memory, were creating a monument for the American Kung Fu star Bruce Lee, because he, they declared, had been much more influential for them in their use, like all the other official socialist and post socialist war heroes. Here in the field of literature and in the arts, I see the most promising attempts to go beyond conventional ways of commemoration. The repercussions of this kind of dealing with the past in the broader society, however, is limited. And sometimes these artists' attempts even are seen more as a betrayal to the nation than as an attempt to open up a more civic perspective on the past. Also, this monument was already destroyed the next day. So you see that the public is not really uh, ready to, to deal with this kind of, of dealing with the past. Symbolic means of representations are, as I said in the beginning, 
a powerful instrument to construct the society's war of memory, both for the good and for the bad. And indeed, we have seen good and bad examples in the former Yugoslavia of making use of such symbolic war representations as well. Some brief remarks and illustrations might be dedicated to this field. Touring, for example, through the memory landscape of the post-Yugoslav space, we indeed can find many examples of a very decent symbolic representation of the war, being guided by the intention, first of all, to offer the people a space for personal grief. Monuments of this kind usually are of a very neutral language. Sometimes they make use of Christian <coughs> symbols. We here have this type of your monument, which is refraining from any heroic language. It's just a place for the people uh, for their uh, grief and mourning. But there are also plenty of examples how war monuments are exploiting metaphors in order to give the war and the dead a national meaning. An example of that would be uh, this one from Croatia as well. And you see the woman uh, which is dedicating her young child to the Croatian coat of arms. So this is a kind of monument which is uh, some kind in, in the sense of the 19th century is uh, linking the war and the debt in the war to the nation uh, and uh, giving uh, the, the war a kind of national meaning, uploading the memory of war with a national uh, meaning. And sometimes this kind of monuments end up in a very belligerent triumphalism, which is resembling the 19th century cult of war, but which seems utterly outdated uh, today. With all my respect for young states like Kosovo and their interest in nation building, I must say that the many war monuments of young masculine war heroes with weapons in their hands, which you can find at different places in Kosovo, in my view, are confusing, and it is hardly imaginable how a society can build up a civic political culture on this kind of symbolic representations. All over Yugoslavia, there, is, there are few, very few monuments which refrain from any exclusive ethnic denomination. Two examples you can find, for example, in Sarajevo with two monuments. The left one is just a simple white stone with an inscription to the, to the victims of the war in four languages without any linkage to any ethnic group. Or the right one is, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the right one is simply a reproduction of the foot cans which were sent to Sarajevo during the siege. So again, here there is no link to any uh, ethnic uh, affiliation of the victims. Yeah. Even less than these examples are examples which intentionally are including the ethnic other into the commemoration. In Croatia, for example, uh, in the city of Osijek, there was built this church-like type monument. Initially, it was dedicated to the Croatian fallen soldiers. But later on, it was added a plate here with the names of all 1,800 victims of the war, including the Serbians' ones. So here, this memory, which in the beginning was more nationalized, was then extended, including also the others. I think this is an example for what I would call an integrated uh, memory going beyond ethnic exclusiveness. But this is all is an exception. Another example uh, would be uh, a monument in the Bosnian city of Kozara. It's a rotunda and you find 1,200 candle lights here which are just dedicated to all victims, not just to one uh, site. Also, symbolic gestures of reconciliation can have a tremendous impact on how a society is coming to terms with the past. And again, such symbolic gestures can either encourage reconciliation or make it more difficult. The German Chancellor Willy Brandt's kneeling down in front of the monument for the victims of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising during his visit to Poland in 1970. You see this picture here uh, 
certainly became one of the most powerful symbols of such a gesture, which not only opened the process of reconciliation between Poland and Germany during the 70s, but this photo and this gesture up until today very much is inscribed into the German collective memory as an important step of Germany's intent to come to the terms with its past. Gestures like this one, in my view, should not be downplayed as a kind of theatrical symbolic politics. Brandt's behavior at that time by far did not meet the approval of most of the Germans. Just the opposite, about half of the Germans at that time saw this kind of gesture as exaggerated and inappropriate. But it nevertheless encouraged a change of mind among many Germans, accepting the need for reconciliation with its neighbors. We haven't seen similar dramatic gestures in the Balkans yet, and maybe they can and should not be repeated. But at least some attempts of a symbolic reconciliation have been undertaken. One of them is, for example, the visit the, Serma, the former Serbian president Tadic during the 10th anniversary of the massacre of Srebrenica. That was the first time that a Serbian politician attended this uh, meeting, and this was the first kind of this, uh, this type of symbolic gestures. I think it certainly is hard to imagine similar steps among Serbian and Albanian politicians for the moment. Too many open conflicts still have to be resolved first, but hopefully at a certain point this kind of symbolic gesture could stimulate the process of reconciliation in this area as well. Any reasonable memory of the past, and here I want to end my paper, should at least take into consideration three aspects. Not regarding if you consider your own war as a just war, or if you have won or lost the war. The first one, in my view, is that you have to try to create what I would like to call an integrative memory. Integrative memory does not mean to forget about your own suffering, but to develop at least empathy for the suffering of others and to integrate into your own memory also what has been done by your own group. Addressing one's own responsibility should not be seen as something which is eroding identity of a society or of the state, but acknowledging responsibility just the opposite can help to ground and to stabilize the identity of a society. Coming to terms with the past, secondly, in my view, always should have in mind that each war creates a plurality of memories, even within the same ethnic group. Soldiers and civilians, refugees and those who had to stay at home, men and women, they all make different experiences during a war, and the memory of war should reflect this diversity. What usually is called a national memory is nothing else but a homogenized and a homogenizing construction which ignores the diversity of experiences and thus always devaluates that. And finally, and the third point, any memory of war should refrain from grounding political projects or fostering primarily national identities. A memory which is primarily seen as an identity project, <laughs> ignores that remembering the war basically should serve the individual people and their need to come to the terms with their experience and their trauma of loss. It should not be exploited for any national or ideological project. That means, and I think this is one of the basic dilemma in the Balkans, this means that the memory of war should not be turned over into the hands of political elites in order to build their legitimacy on the perception of the past. How to remember the war should be a matter for the civil society and their negotiations and not for the politicians. The last instrument I, mentioning, I mentioned, silencing the past, might not be an option any longer after all wars and conflicts we have witnessed over the last decades. But in addressing the legacy of wars, we nevertheless 
might rely more on discrete grassroots activities, on family narratives, and on the soft power of artistic performances instead of noisy debates and big monuments. Maybe it's not a solution, but a useful idea to follow an advice which I saw a couple of years ago in the streets of Sarajevo, and there was written a transparent in the city, the number of monuments erected to one person is proportional to the lack of personal freedom. Thank you very much. <laughs>